So today I'm just going to be continuing in our, our recap sessions, looking at the big story. And these sessions cover um, approximately First and Second Chronicles, which are in and of themselves recap books covering the story so far. And I've mentioned many times that there's two major themes in scripture, namely exile and exodus. So traveling away from God and then traveling back to God. And it's the story of the soul. It's the story of your story and it's my story, our own exile away from God's presence and then our own exodus out of bondage back to the Father. One of the major differences between Israel and the nations around them was the sacrificial system that they had. In that Israel's system had an ethical dimension, since every human being is an image of God. That's how we're made, that's our end, you know, that we might be images of God. How you treat another human being, it's a religious act because it's a reflection on how we treat God himself. Pagans wouldn't let you just walk in and desecrate their temples. You know, you don't want to offend the spirits, as it were. You wouldn't just walk into a temple of Odin or Thor and just smear poop all over it or anything like that, would you? So in the same way, Israel don't want us to desecrate other human beings because each one of them is an image of God. God doesn't want his image defaced. So how you treat another human being is how you affects your relationship with God because they are his image in the world. And leaving Egypt, the people of Israel found themselves in the desert. And I've said it before, but the desert is the school of unlearning. Israel had to unlearn its addiction to Egypt and to rely upon the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And the desert of life is also our school of unlearning the self, uh, you know, in that sense. It's a school to train us to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. He had his own 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. And he knows what it's like for every single one of us. The desert is about choice. Our choices and your choices and my choices. It's all about the direction of our heart. Are we heading towards God or away from God? To the promised land or to Egypt? Are we turning back towards Egypt as some of them wanted to do? Or are we headed towards the promised land? As Christians, the desert place, the wilderness, can become the place of transformation. James says um, in his letter that we should consider our trials in this life nothing but joy because they have a perfecting effect so that we will be complete and perfect. It's, it's growing up, okay? So it's the discipline, the sort of teaching of the child so they grow up. Um, and if we're clay in the potter's hands, if God is through the process of this world, this life, if this is his creating us into his image, into his likeness, you know, then everything that we're facing is, you know, him sort of moulding and shaping us from the dust of the ground, from clay. You know, it's him sort of poking eyes, you know, forming our ears, it's sort of shaping our brow and our our face and our arms and our legs and molding and shaping the clay into an image. We are the clay in the potter's hands and the trials of this life and the beating and softening of the clay so that something wonderful can be made. And the desert is that arena of transformation. And Paul in Romans 8, 17 writes, and if children if we're children of God, then namely, then heirs, namely heirs of God and also fellow heirs with Christ. OK, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. OK, so our glorification, our becoming like God, our sharing in the divine nature, as Peter puts it, um, is linked with sharing in Christ's suffer 
writes, Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1 verses 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my physical body for the sake of his body, the church, what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And Paul elaborates in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through to 18. Therefore, we do not despair, even if our physical body is wearing away, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light suffering is producing for us okay, an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comprehension. Because we're not looking at what can be seen, uh, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Okay, so Paul's saying that our momentary light afflictions with the, the body that is wearing away, that is suffering, um, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Okay, but we can't see it because it's eternal. Okay. So Paul is a man rejected, he's stoned, he's beaten, he's shipwrecked, he's abandoned by his friends, he's chased out of town, he's referred to the, you know, to things like his thorn in the flesh, the eye disease that he lived with, you know, the, um, and he refers to these as momentary light suffering producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. This is the school of the desert friends. We can leave Egypt in a day and a night, but it takes God a lifetime to get Egypt out of us, okay, to transform us. And the purpose of death within God's plan is that we ultimately learn to be reliant upon him. We bring nothing into this world, okay, we come into this world naked and we can take nothing with us. All of us will die. OK, it's a certainty in life. The death rate is 100 um, percent. And death teaches us that we're not immortal, though we might wish we were. The money, sex and power, the things that we crave and give our lives to, getting a good job, making sure we've got a good car, whatever else they are. All these things that we build and base our lives upon, none of it's going to last. It's all going to fade or back into dust. They are dust and we are dust. Okay, And each of us has a choice whilst we're in the body. Do we redirect our lives whilst we live in the flesh towards God as the highest good, to things that endure, to things like faith, to hope and to love, uh, things that Paul says do not end in that sense, you know, um, or do we focus on the things of this life that fade and that, that will fade away? pass. Paul says faith, hope and love will remain. Okay, so what do we give our lives to whilst we're living in the body? Okay. Suffering, sickness and death teach us to rely upon God. And if we let them, they will teach us to become that soft clay in the potter's hands. And we can resist against them and as such, we might become hard, we might become brittle, but, you know, pottery that just breaks, you know, it can't be moulded and shaped into something beautiful. God himself can, can do that, you know, he can cause us to become soft again, and he will do. Um, but it's that, do we make ourselves hard? Do we give our yes to God and say, make me, shape me, form me into all that you want for me? C.S. Lewis, in his Mere Christianity, puts it this way. The command, be ye perfect, is not idealistic, idealistic gas, uh, nor is it a command to do the impossible. He is going to make us into creatures that obey that command. He said in the Bible that we are gods and he's going to make good of his words, if we let him, for we can prevent him. If we choose, he will make the feeblest and the filthy of us into a god or a goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, 
pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love that we cannot now imagine. A bright stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale. His own boundless power, delight and goodness. The process will be long and in parts very painful, but that is what we're in for. Nothing less, he's meant what he said. Okay, so that's C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, just reflecting this thought, really, of how God moulds us and shapes us so that we become what Jesus Christ is, so that we become like him. You know, that we also take on, fully become images of God. We become what humanity is always meant to be, um, which is found only in the second Adam, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we become that which he is. Um, and so we perfectly reflect God into the world. So to quote Paul again in Romans 8 verse 18, he says this, For I consider that our present sufferings cannot be compared to the coming glory that will be revealed to us. That's wonderful, isn't it? That our present sufferings, if you put them on a scales, present sufferings, and then compared to coming glory, they do not even compare, okay? These are just light momentary afflictions compared to the infinite weight of glory that awaits us on the other side, okay? So the story of the wilderness is Israel's refusal to get with the program. <laughs> they don't want the bed desert in that sense to be the way to the promised land, okay? They'd actually prefer to be in Egypt. I think many of us would. We, we like Egypt, you know, we like the delights. We like, you know, Netflix and everything else, you know, just being entertained and entertaining our minds. You know, we just like to, um, to eat and have our fill, to enjoy life, you know, the pleasures of this world without giving thought that all of this is going to fade. You know, it is dust. We're dust and we will return to dust. Okay, are we building something that will last forever? You know, Paul uses the the idea of a fire, doesn't he? And he says, you know, that when we're put in the fire, what remains? You know, um, if we're built with a foundation of silver and gold, that will remain. But if it's straw, it will be burnt up, and there will be nothing left. We will be saved as if through a fire. But all that we've built in this life will be gone. Okay, and I think that's um, something to dwell upon, isn't it? Something to reflect on. Um, what are we building? What are we devoting our time, our energy, our resources to? Is it things that will last forever? Or is it things that are only temporary? Okay. In many of the Israelites who wanted to go back to Egypt, they preferred the luxury of Egypt, even though they were slaves. They preferred to have, you know, we were well fed. We weren't just eating manna, you know. Um, so would we prefer to be in slavery, to sin, to death, to hell? Or do we want to be free? It's a question, isn't it, for each one of us. Okay. And often when we turn our backs on God, uh, we experience it as God turning his back on us. C.S. Lewis says in The Problem of Pain, I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful rebels to the end, and that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. That's uh, something else to reflect upon, isn't it? How really each one of us is responsible for how we react to God at every moment, day by day moment by moment. Are we caught up with the things of this world, things that fade, dust, things that will be no more? Or are we caught up with things that are eternal? Uh, many of you know, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, that I'm not a hugger. I'm not a hugging kind of person. Um, and to some, a hug feels great. You love it, you want it. Uh, others, however, feel the same hug with the same intention, and they feel uncomfortable. It's unpleasant. It, it might even feel wrong. 
the hug is the same, but our experience of it differs depending upon us. And this is the same. It's the love of God feels different depending on our own experience, our own place. So the love of God feels, well, our God is a consuming fire, the book of Hebrews says. Um, so it feels like a burning flame to those who oppose God, who resent God, whose hearts are darkened and far away from God. They don't want to know him. And to them, it's a burning flame. And yet for us who love God, that fire, that consuming fire, is divine love. It is a burning sensation of beauty. Okay, so the same fire that our God is a consuming fire is experienced in two separate ways, depending. And this is what Lewis means by the doors of hell are locked on the inside. It's about our state of our own soul. Are we open to God or are we far away from God? Do we reject him? In which case, we're going to experience it as a burning flame. Um, or will we experience it as divine love, something beautiful, something wonderful, something rapturous, you know, that we just get caught up in the beauty and the wonder of God. Okay, so um, just again, something to reflect on, isn't it? You know, how these two experiences in our own lives. Okay. And... Um, we can see that the, the church, as the bride of Christ, is a mother who births us into being, through the waters of baptism, into this eternal life. It's a bride for whom Christ has died to redeem. And we're not individuals all doing our own thing, but rather we are the body of Christ. And the church gives birth to us. You know, we don't just come to God on our own, but rather we come through the church, don't we? Um, through the body of and we're given birth through the waters of baptism into this new reality where we can feed on the life of Christ and we become like him. And John Wesley said that there is no religion that is not social, no holiness that is not social. And by that he meant that in order to become holy, in order to become blameless and filled with his divine love, to grow up fully into maturity, that we need each other. We cannot do it on our own. We need people around us. <laughs> who can shape us and form us and, and guide us as the body of Christ in the world. And the early Christian, Irenaeus, uses the example of Jonah. If Jonah had not been caught in the storm, if he had not been thrown overboard, if he had not drowned in the waters, then swallowed by a creature of the deep, if none of that had ever happened, uh, he would never have repented. The Assyrians would never have turned to the true and living God, suffering therefore for every single one of us, has redemptive purpose. And God permits it in order that he might bring good out of evil uh, to form us into his likeness. And salvation, therefore, is not a solo mission, but rather it takes place as part of a community. And friends, if you know someone is going through a hard time, why not ring them or text them this week? Why not send them a gift or a word of encouragement as those who are suffering and ask them, uh, for help is not giving up, rather it is refusing to give up. Okay, Asking for help is nothing to be ashamed of. It's saying, I don't want to give up, therefore I'm going to ask someone to lift me. You know, it's like, um, you know, it's like Moses having his hands lifted up where he could not hold them anymore. You know, so that's just what help is asking for. It's saying, I'm not giving up, I'm not going to drop my hands. Therefore I need others to come alongside me who can help me lift up my hands. Okay, so Paul writes in Romans 8, 18. I consider that our present sufferings cannot be compared to the coming glory that will be revealed to us. Friends, that's true for Paul and it's also true for us. Whilst on earth we are strangers, we're exiles. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our king is Jesus and our fellow citizens are found all over the world in every nation. So by the time we get in the story, past the kings to Jeremiah and the prophets, we read in Jeremiah 29 verse 7, we're told, seek the welfare of the city that you will find your welfare. And that's the attitude that each of us is called to have to all the nations of this earth. 
they're going to fade. They are dust, just as we are dust. But we want the nation in which we happen to be born into, um, that we currently live in, to do well and to be a blessing to others. And therefore, we must not forget that our primary citizenship is in heaven. Um, Paul says we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. We want to experience that reality in the present. But God is eternal. Okay, So what is God is always with God in that sense, isn't it? Because there's no change in God. Um, so we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Okay, so like Israel, we're called not to place our trust in princes in this world or prime ministers, etc. Uh, let us not reject God by placing our hope on human kings, presidents or prime ministers like the other nations. Laws can enforce penalties, but only the gospel and the spirit of God can change people's hearts. David was only uh, a young shepherd boy when he was anointed as the next king of Israel behind Saul's back. And yet it was 15 years between that time that he was anointed king and actually became king. And yet in this time he would face the giant Goliath, was banished by Saul, hid in the desert and the wilderness of outlaws, lived on the run, forced out of the nation of Israel and fought many battles. He was tested just like Joseph was in Egypt. And so God could convert him to be a shepherd into a king so that he might be the shepherd king, you know, prototype or in that sense or a pattern that Christ is the genuine reality of. David had the opportunity to kill Saul, to touch God's anointed, as it were, to actually put physical violence upon Saul, um, caught him with his trousers down in the back of a cave. And yet he didn't do it. He didn't physically harm Saul. He cut off a bit of his thing and said, you know, look how I haven't done it. He refused to take matters into his own hands and rather trusted in the goodness and faithfulness of God. God is the one, friends, who is causing us to exist moment by moment. If he stopped, even for a moment, we would all cease to exist. And yet at the same time, Often we do not feel his presence, but rather feel his absence. And this is the moment where we learn to wait upon God, to trust in his word. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, we read, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God is able to bring him back to life. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. This is a wonderful thought, I think, to reflect upon. Abraham had faith in the resurrection. And I think that's what Paul means by having the faith of Abraham, that we believe in the resurrection, that God could bring the dead back to life. Paul writes in Romans 4, 17, Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life, who creates new things out of nothing. And that's the faith of Abraham, to believe in the resurrection, to be a resurrection people and believe that God will bring good out of bad life out of death and to know that spring always follows winter psalm 105 19 um, reads this until the time came to fulfill his dreams the lord tested joseph's character and that's how we experience this life isn't it this life that we live it's a test ultimately that's what it is and whilst we live in the body of the flesh God is moulding us, he's shaping us, he's transforming our character into the likeness of Christ. His image is revealed in the man Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, John Bear says, you know, that Jesus shows us what it is to be God by the way he dies as a man. Okay, and that's wonderful to reflect upon, isn't it really, when we really think about that he shows us what it is to be God and by the way he dies as a man in self-sacrificial love for the other. Okay, That's what it is to be God, to pour out ourselves for the sake of others. Okay, so um, To say, not my will, but thy will be done. Okay. Um, and friends, I might not know what each of you are facing right now. But God knows all that you are facing. Friends, just as 
David had to face giants, banishments, the loss of friendship, exile, and life on the run. So each of us will face those wilderness, those desert experiences, those dark nights of the soul. And these are important times for spiritual growth. You might be going through such a time right now. In the Song of Songs, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we read, All night long on my bed I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. And so I looked for him but did not find him. And you might be feeling that right now. You might be saying, oh, I'm on a quest for God. I'm on a quest to, to know him, to experience him, to be filled with his love. And yet, like in the Song of Songs, you're going about the city. You're looking in all the streets, in all the corners. You're searching for the one that your heart longs for, but you cannot find him. And dark nights are often the time in which God is stripping away the work in our life. He's doing the most work. When we feel his absence is actually when he's most present. Okay, it's like the um, you know, the footprints poem, isn't it? You know, it's just like, you know, I see just one set of footprints rather than two. And you're just like, where were you, God, when I was going through that time? And um the reply is that's when I was carrying you. You know, it's um it's when God is most absent is perhaps when he's most present. And the dark nights are times when God is doing that stripping work in our life. And he is allowing us to feel stuck, to feel frustrated, to feel distant, so that we might let go of the idols that we're clinging to and press on towards union with him. And the times that we feel the most distant are often the times where he's doing the greatest work in our lives. The times when we're stuck are actually the times when we're sliding forward. And often we feel stuck, we can feel that we're not growing spiritually and perhaps we need to go somewhere else or do something else. Uh, that I just need to go somewhere where they're going to kickstart my spiritual life. Uh, but the truth is that the dark night is essential to spiritual growth. Discontent is God's way of allowing us to seek him more in the quiet place of our own heart. Each of us are responsible for our own spiritual growth. The, the church isn't responsible. The pastor certainly isn't responsible. The elders aren't responsible. Each of us are responsible for ourselves. Each of us will one day have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ to give an account of our lives. We are the ones responsible for our own lives. In Acts 17, verse 31, we read, he, that is God, has set a day he's going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has designated, having provided proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. OK, so Jesus is the one who will judge the world in righteousness. OK, and the proof that God's chosen him is that he resurrected him from the dead. It's fairly simple. That's what Paul says. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 to 18 writes now the lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is present there is freedom and we all with unveiled faces reflecting the glory of the lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another which is from the lord who is the spirit and that friends that is each of our calling to reflect the glory of the Lord into the world, to be transformed from one degree of glory to another into the image of Christ so that we become fully like him in every way, who is the perfect image of God. And that's what God had planned from the very foundations of the earth, that through the crucified and risen one, he would make a new humanity and a new creation. Okay. So in Israel and Judah go into exile, the message of the prophets is the message is that the promised Messiah will be the one through whom the lost tribes will be gathered, the nations will turn to the God of Israel, and ultimately it's the new creation through the Messiah, through death and resurrection. And the message again and again is that judgment comes as God punishes evil, but the purpose of judgment is to purify, not simply to punish. God wants to restore them after judgment. Okay, um, so Psalm 30 
verses four and five. Sing to the Lord, you faithful followers of his, give thanks to his holy name. For his anger lasts only for a brief moment, but his good favour restores one's life. One may experience sorrow during the night, but joy arrives in the morning. Even wicked Sodom, you know, uh, which is the archetype of, you know, fire, brimstone, judgment, you know, total destruction. You know, as fire rains down from heaven and destroys the city and wipes it out will one day be restored. We read in Ezekiel 16, 53. I will restore their fortunes, the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters, and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters, along with your fortunes along with them. Isn't that glorious, friends? That even Sodom will be restored. The judgment comes, but it is a purifying fire through which God is remaking something glorious and beautiful. So over the next few hundred years after this, the people of Judah come under Greek influence and Greek rule as the armies of Alexander the Great sweep across the world. And they're caught between the Greek Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt and the Greek Seleucids in Syria. And they're constantly fighting. Um, and their very identity is the, the Judean people is going to be attacked by the Greeks directly as they dedicate the temple to Zeus and try and burn pigs on the altar. But a, a faithful remnant arise who want to restore the religion of Judea and re-establish a Judean identity. And their stories are told um, in the writings written between the Old and the New Testament, the, the books of Tobit, of Judith, of Baruch, of Sirach of first and second Maccabees and of the wisdom. And in these books, we, we hear about the heroes who live between those two, the Old Testament and the New Testament and their stories and what happened in their lives. But eventually the independent Judean nation will make an alliance with Rome and invite the Romans in, uh, but that will eventually lead to Roman control and the setting of the scene for the New Testament. So in conclusion, friends, let us take heart that the end is already written. God will be all in all. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We might not know that in the present, we might not experience that in the present. We might not understand our own trials and temptations as we're caught in the stream but we're flowing downhill to God being all in all. We will be with him and we will be like him. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we will be like our Lord Jesus Christ. That when we see him, we will be like him. And we just thank you for that, Lord. That you are molding and shaping and forming us. As we flow down river, Lord, as we're being battered by the rocks on the way, that you are leading us to the place where God, you yourself, will be all in all. And every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.